hordes of desert locusts periodically descend on Africa and invade human territory. The sheer voracity of these insects dropping from the skies turns them into an unstoppable plague. The resultant devastation of the crops plunges whole populations into famine and utter destitution. Where does this curse come from? What triggers the outbreaks? What do we really know about migratory locusts? Today, scientists are looking for new ways to prevent the return of this plague. Since time immemorial, the migratory locust has been seen as one of the worst plagues on humanity. Invading swarms of billions of locusts can wreak havoc from India all the way to the western shores of the Atlantic Ocean. But West Africa is the area that usually bears the brunt of locust devastation. Niamey, Niger. The main road east out of the capital carries a man on a mission. Dismayed by the sufferings of the rural population during the last locust invasion, Antoine Foucault, a French entomologist, is attempting to solve the mystery of the desert locust. He wants to find out what triggers the outbreaks, a phenomenon still largely unexplained and totally unpredictable. He knows the answers to be found in the field, or rather, the desert at the heart of the Sahel region of West Africa, where trouble brews when the rains set in. <laughs> to start his search, Antoine will make use of the early warning network spread out all over Niger and neighboring countries. The locust threat is taken very seriously in these parts. This lookout post in Tanut, on the edge of the desert, still bears the scars of the last swarms to pass by here. Of the 12,000 locust species known to the world, Schistocerca gregaria, or the desert locust, is the most harmful to mankind. It's feared for its voracious appetite and its horrific destructive potential. But what fascinates scientists is its incredible ability to metamorphose. <clears throat> the insect has several different faces, several lives, and it was only recently that scientists realized they were dealing with one and the same species. Generally speaking, migratory locusts lead a solitary, harmless life in desert regions. What isn't known is why, at certain points in time, they congregate and change form, color, and behavior. In their gregarious phase, they end up forming gigantic hordes that appease their enormous appetites by ravaging the regions they traverse. These transformations are a mystery that generations of scientists have struggled to solve. How and why does solitary, peaceful Dr. Jekyll become monstrous Mr. Hyde? To solve the mystery, Antoine's got to locate the source of the outbreaks, the areas where the metamorphosis takes place, and above all, the factors that trigger the fateful change. But the sheer immensity of the territory to be explored makes this a daunting task. Where should he start looking? Where can he pick up the locust's track? And who might help to find them? Yeah. 
Down through the ages, the nomads of the Sahel have traveled vast stretches of the desert in search of pasture for their herds. Their routes often cross those of the locusts, so they're likely to have plenty of useful information. These herdsmen regularly come to the weekly market in Tanut, the only source of supplies for these nomadic tribes. This is where Antoine's investigation begins. By questioning the herdsman, Antoine picks up the leads he's looking for. Several of them tell of locusts recently spotted further north, towards the Great Desert. Leaving behind the villages and farms, Antoine and his guide plunge into the steppes of Niger. Each caravan they encounter provides precious, but often conflicting information. Some have seen locusts up north, others towards the west. From one camp to the next, Antoine moves deeper and deeper into the arid wilderness. After several days of searching, he has a few last opportunities to talk to the desert nomads at the watering holes. But he gets conflicting reports there too. Antoine has to face the fact that his mission will be longer and harder than expected. To find the locusts, he'll have to venture far into the desert. The Sahara, the greatest desert on the planet. An ocean of rocks and sand sculpted by the winds, where the temperature often exceeds 140 degrees Fahrenheit by day, and the nights are freezing cold. What life exists in the dunes is driven by two imperatives, finding food and shelter from the heat. To protect itself from the scorching sun, this jerboa, or desert rat, digs little tunnels a foot and a half deep. During the day, it holds up there, where it's a bit cooler and damper than above ground. Insects, Reptiles and birds all have secret recipes for surviving in such extreme conditions. The Great Desert is the migratory locust's true home. It lives a peaceful life out here, away from its kin. This is known as its solitary phase, and nothing could be more different from the formidable destroyer it can transform itself into. It is a large insect, up to four inches long. With its highly developed and powerful hind legs, it can make huge leaps which often give it a decisive edge over its predators. This young, solitary phase desert locust is about three weeks old. The eighth plague visited upon the Egyptians in the Bible seems pretty harmless here. Still without wings, it devours the equivalent of its body mass in fresh vegetation every day. Its color conceals its presence among the leaves. 
But in spite of this camouflage, it's never entirely safe from predators and makes an easy meal. The solifuge, a desert arachnid, is named for its tendency to flee the sun. But it will emerge from shade to feast on such a large, tender morsel. Solifuge uses two highly developed and powerful pincers to perforate, cut, and slash its victims. It's a swift and formidable predator. The solifuge is distantly related to both scorpion and spider. This desert predator prefers to hunt at night and is called a wind scorpion because it moves like the wind. It is the fastest thing on eight legs in the world. Five weeks into the expedition, Antoine Foucault tirelessly continues his quest. He's hell-bent on bearding the locust in its desert den to solve the age-old mystery. This scientific approach is unusual, for this insect of many faces has been very rarely studied in its natural habitat. The most recent information he received on their location has led him out of Niger into neighboring Mauritania. Here, he's joined by Sidi Uld Eli and Adam Abari, both from the Mauritanian Locust Control Center. It's very difficult to study locusts in their natural surroundings. They are very elusive, and you must look long and hard to spot them in bushes and shrubs. They are also very shy, which makes them even harder to catch. Antoine has noticed that these locusts don't fly by day, so he changes tactics. And with what he has in the car, he devises an unusual trap. Many different insects are irresistibly drawn to his improvised but highly effective light trap. It's a golden opportunity for this passionate naturalist to snatch a few specimens for his collection. Who knows, he might even discover some new species. A million species of insects have already been identified, but it's estimated that another two or three million remain to be discovered. So generations of entomologists have their work cut out for them. Suddenly, a sizable creature takes the bait. It's an adult locust. The characteristic shape of the abdomen shows it's a young solitary phase female. Its body is still supple, the wings undamaged. It has just molted, shed its skin and slipped into a new one. 
toute fraîche. Il n'y a pas très longtemps qu'elle a mué celle-là. This catch is Antoine's big chance to observe the locust's most important metamorphosis. The maturing of a larva into an adult with two pairs of wings. A locust's lifespan varies from two to six months, depending on its environment. As it develops, it repeatedly outgrows its skin. From birth to maturity, it will shed its skin five times in a tricky operation called molting. The most remarkable such transformation is its last, called the imaginal molt. This delicate process takes about two hours. Antoine has never watched this prodigious feat in nature before. This young locust first performs some acrobatics and hangs upside down to help it pop out of its old skin. Then it turns into a contortionist, writing itself and finally leaving its old body behind. But it's got to be careful. One false move, the slightest shock, could cause serious injury. Its new carapace is still soft and extremely fragile. Very gingerly, the locust spreads its wings to embark on its new life. But it'll have to wait a few more hours to fly, the time it takes for its wings to dry and harden. To complete its metamorphosis, the insect slowly turns from green to brown, the color of a solitary phase adult locust. To avoid the daytime heat and its predators, the solitary phase locust prefers to fly at night. It explores its new terrain in search of food. It can fly as high as the clouds and cover up to 60 miles in a single flight. Sometimes favorable winds bring males and females together. The male locust can now practice his powers of seduction. He wafts pheromones on the breeze toward the female. His antennae are bathed in an irresistible perfume that's guaranteed to persuade her of his charms. This olfactory communication is as important as any visual or auditory signals. Back in the field, the team resumes its investigation. 
The scientists want to discover the curious alchemy that makes a solitary creature congregate and swarm into a horde of millions of insects. According to the Mauritanian naturalists, the desert areas most congenial to swarming are those where dense shrubs grow. The locusts seem to find being around certain plants ideal for their development. They like to feed on plants like acacia, panicum or tribulus. So why do locusts apparently prefer certain plants to others? Are they attracted by odors given off by the plants? And does that trigger the swarming process? By feeding his captives carefully selected vegetation, Antoine tries to determine how these plants influence the locust transformation. A storm is approaching. This rain will play a key part in Antoine's investigation. He's certain that the rain will unlock the secret to this insect mystery. Rain is a major factor in triggering the metamorphosis from solitary to the social or gregarious phase. In the Sahara, even the lightest shower works a sea change in the ecosystem. The surplus humidity gives rise to green patches in the desert. Fresh fare for the locusts. Drawn by the prospect of a feast, they gather to gorge themselves and reproduce en masse. Later on, the sun returns with a vengeance and parches the patches of green. The locusts are forced to huddle up in what remains of the vegetation. Within the space of a few days, their numbers can explode by a factor of a hundred, even a thousand. It doesn't take long for the team to realize the area is infested. As their numbers steadily swell in such close quarters, the recurrent visual and bodily contact causes a physiological shock, a unique phenomenon in the animal kingdom known as gregarization. <laughs> The scientists readily perceive that these are not solitary phase locusts. This is a new generation, nothing like the specimens they saw just a couple of days ago on the same spot. No doubt about it, these are gregarious insects, wholly adapted to living in a group. Okay, so we have 3, 6. Sidi looks worried. He asks the team to help him estimate the number of locusts at the site. This is a routine procedure. They count each locust along a 100 meter stretch. While counting, they see locusts in different phases of development. The transformation process evidently doesn't always happen in sync, so different generations coexist on the same site. The count confirms what the scientists feared, more than 10,000 insects per acre. This density level means an outbreak is underway. Sidi decides to sound the alarm. The 
Mauritanian locust control specialists soon arrive. They've got to stop the buildup of locusts before they form a rampaging swarm. Chemical weapons will have to be deployed. Over the past few decades, millions of tons of pesticides used to stop each outbreak have had a drastic impact on the environment. To limit the damage, the team acts fast to nip the plague in the bud whenever possible. In the absence of other instant remedies, these preemptive strikes represent real progress towards low impact pest control. Antoine is about to lose the subjects of his study, but he knows they have to be wiped out before it's too late. How else to protect the lives of millions of people who depend on the crops for their sustenance? In the Mauritanian capital, Nouakchott, the Locust Control Headquarters keeps constant watch over the changing situation. During the rainy season, observers are stationed throughout the country. Today, they are on high alert for any sign of invasion. Head of the center, Mohamed Uld Baba, has been receiving hourly updates on a swarm flying over the north of the country. He has notified Antoine, and this news may allow him to resume his investigation. But where is this swarm from? Has it eluded the observers in the field? Unfortunately, locusts have no respect for national borders. These migratory marauders are from another country, and borne by the winds, they turn up where no one expects them. The cloud of raiders from the sky often changes direction and can cover over 100 kilometers in a single day. A genuine juggernaut is on its way. These gregarious locusts have markedly evolved since their solitary phase. They've changed appearance and behavior. Now yellow and red, they stay with the group and fly only by day. Migratory locusts are not only voracious, but also extremely fertile increasing their numbers as much as tenfold with each succeeding generation. They can wait for months to breed, but as soon as the rains return, they become terribly fruitful and multiply rapidly. When ready to lay eggs, the female starts by feeling the ground to make sure the earth is damp enough for her brood. She then extends her abdomen and digs a protective hole in which to deposit big bunches of 60 to 80 eggs. At every stop along the way, the locusts leave in their wake clusters of time bombs, which are impossible to detect in the immensity of the desert. Antoine has never been this close to his goal before. He rushes over to the infested areas, hoping to see a new generation of gregarious phase locusts hatch. 
and observe how they behave. But deep down in the dunes, the next outbreak has already begun. The ground moisture from the recent rainfall has accelerated the hatching process, and the larvae have begun emerging in their millions. These newborn larvae, just a few millimeters long, seem exhausted from the exertion of climbing up out of their subterranean nest. After a few minutes, they darken in hue. Their color will evolve as they mature. These young locusts repeatedly sniff and rub up against their cohorts in a restless frenzy before setting out to discover their new playgrounds. Their numbers are impressive. In less than a month, they'll be adults, ready to form threatening swarms. Their bodies are compact, like boxes ready to rumble. As they gain weight, the young also gain self-confidence and sally forth, always in little gangs to appease their monstrous appetites. The bigger they get, the more they eat. Engrossed in exploring its brave new world, a locust nymph inadvertently wanders into the clutches of a fearsome mantis, Iris oratoria. All the desert fauna, mammals, reptiles, birds, insects, feast on these teeming hordes. Over 10% of the offspring are lost to predators. 
But there's safety in numbers, and these locusts are so abundant that the losses have no impact on the size of the group. Soon enough, the black stains on the landscape merge to form a cohesive mass. Each insect remains within the confines of these marching shadows, without trying to break ranks. Little by little, from one malt to the next, the locust pigmentation changes. Some have already turned yellow. A few days later, a prospector has spotted the menace. Antoine and Sidi are immediately alerted by radio. Several large groups of young gregarious phase locusts have infested a 25-acre area. For the time being, the raid is still confined to a desert zone, but pastures and crops lie nearby, so there's no time to lose. As luck would have it, the locusts are not very far from the camp. Antoine and Sidi dash over to join the prospector. Two distinct groups are found. The officials from the control center are well aware of the importance of the scientists' research, so they give them 24 hours to study the locust before launching the extermination. The scientists are eager to observe the beginning of an outbreak for the very first time. Once they get there, Antoine and Sidi are astounded. The horde is far more numerous than they had imagined. Each tuft of grass, each bush, each shrub is besieged by thousands of young locusts. Insects have now turned yellow. They're 30 days old, still without wings. In the fifth and final stage of their development, they have tripled in size and weight. After a night spent perched on the vegetation, sheltered from the icy cold, they climb down to the ground to warm up their bodies in the morning sun. Then they gather together to form a gigantic biological travelator. The direction they head off in seems to depend on the prevailing winds. Marching slowly at first, they gradually increase their pace as the temperature rises. A rolling band of larvae like this one can advance over two kilometers per day. How is it possible for thousands of individual creatures to move as one? Who is leading the troops? Where are they headed? They don't slow their pace till they've found food. 
In a single day, a horde of three million locusts can consume up to three tons of vegetation. These locusts haven't had a meal yet today. Within minutes, they wreak wholesale devastation before moving on in search of new plunder. It takes them less than two hours to dispose of an acre of sorghum, wheat, fruit trees, legumes, cotton, and pastures. The migratory locust will go for any wild or cultivated plants in its path. Nothing can withstand its onslaught. From afar, the other contingent approaches. Will the two groups simply cross paths? Or will they merge? What mysterious force controls and coordinates their movements? Hosts converge, confusion reigns. The troops seem to be scattering. But after a few moments of hesitation, they all fall into formation. Now they're a real army on the march. The advancing cohort doesn't slow down till sunset. As the temperature drops, they slacken their pace and take to the bushes and tall grass, where they'll spend the night jam-packed in a compact mass. The scientists continue watching this daunting display up to the very last moment. Antoine notices an important detail. A number of cast-off skins lie strewn around the bushes. That means the locust's last molt has begun, and that they have begun final phase before the birth of the swarm. Today has been rich in insights and discoveries for the scientists. Hence Antoine's reluctance to abandon his subjects to their fate. Opportunities to study a group like this one are few and far between, which makes their observations all the more invaluable. There's no time left to watch nature run its course. They've got to make their way for the exterminators, who will eradicate the invaders in a few hours' time. In the bush, the final metamorphosis continues. The emergence of wings signals the birth of a monster. Wholly uncontrollable, it will soon take to the skies.
By the first light of dawn, the pest control squad is already hard at work. They've got to annihilate the locusts before they take off again. Once again, chemical weapons will be deployed. Nipping the epidemic in the bud with the appropriate methods will limit the quantity of chemicals used and limit their impact on the environment and on local human populations. Sidi and Antoine are aware that this extermination strategy won't keep the locusts from reappearing as soon as conditions permit. But for the time being, it's the only way to stave off the threat. Up to the very last minute, the two scientists continue collecting specimens. After several months in close contact with the desert locust, their objectives remain unchanged. Their fascination with this enigmatic insect is now, as ever, driven by a fervent desire to help millions of people whose livelihood and sustenance are permanently jeopardized by this age-old plague. <laughs> Images and reverberations of the last invasion are still running through Antoine's mind. The ravaged crops, the look of horror and hopelessness on the faces of the locals when a passing swarm blackens the sun, the deafening throb of clouds of insects descending on villages. There's still so much to discover. Will the conflict between man and locust ever end? Locusts form part of a biological balance whose mechanisms we have yet to master. Their transition from a solitary to a gregarious state by changing appearance and behavior is unique in the animal kingdom. What are the evolutionary advantages of this metamorphosis for the migratory locust? Is the only point for it to colonize new territories, thereby improving the species' odds of survival in space and time? Current day advances in the life sciences are providing new angles of approach to these phenomena. The analysis of pheromones shows that certain molecules the locusts use to communicate favor their metamorphosis. So tweaking those signals might alter their behavior and limit their propensity to congregate. Scientists are now convinced that the migratory locust uses a language of visual and tactile signals. So deciphering that language will probably prove the most effective way to stave off these fascinating but formidable foes. Thank you.